afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion on the digital identity and its importance to the digital economy. My name is Sam Gemguni, and I will be co-moderating with Nolwazi Shope. Our discussion today will be looking at digital identity with two incredibly experienced and seasoned speakers whom Nolwazi will introduce to us. To give you a background understanding of why this topic is important, I want to just give you a short um, description of the work that we're currently doing within the digital economy at Digital Frontiers. We come from the basis that the digital economy in Africa will improve access to quality basic services and increase the transparency and accountability of the public sector and underpin human rights. It can transform the delivery of public services, including healthcare, education, and agriculture. Digital Frontiers is interested in this fast evolving landscape of the digital economy. And as such, we have embarked on a program called the Certified Digital Economy Practitioner Program, which will look at several topics within the digital economy. This uh, will be from the perspective of developing countries and low and income, low income and vulnerable population groups. And as such, um, we are interested, therefore, in how digital identity is particularly important to the digital economy and, and how it can thrive. I will now hand over to Norazi, who will introduce our speakers, and we will just kick off with a brief uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Samke. And I'd like to say a big hello and thank you to Paul and Robert for um, being here. Um, thank you so much for honoring us with your time and your insights. Um, just And thank you to everyone for taking your time out from wherever you are in the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to our a panel on digital identity and its importance in the digital economy. Um, I, to introduce our special guests, it need not take too much time so that we can get into our discussion. And please feel free to drop in your questions in the questions tab or in the chat, we'll be toggling through to find them and ask them to Paul and Robert. So let me get down to introducing them. So our first guest that we have today is Paul Macon. Um, he is, as I saw on his website, the manager of or the head of uh, Truve. And he is also our guest, our special guest always in our digital identity course, who is always a treat to me and um, a treat to the students every, um, that on the digital identity course that you offer at, at DFI. He has more than 20 years experience in DFS and he, has, he worked on what was um, developed and then launched and is now known as Impesa. From then on, he's moved on to his focus on digital identity and how it can work for um, people in DFS. And then we've also got um, Robert Karanja, who's a, a media. He is the director of um, responsible technology. And uh, he was with Safaricom. And now his focus is on um, the evolution of digital identification um, and uh, how it can be used, including user value and control and security. So we've got an incredible panel with us today. And so we'll be jumping straight into our questions. But by, by all means, any question that I have for you, Paul, Robert, please feel free to also jump in. And likewise, any question I have for you, Robert, Paul, please feel free to jump in. And I, both of your first questions are pretty similar because I'm trying to get the discussion sort of started with you both at the beginning. And then we'll see if we get any questions as well as we go along from between ourselves and the audience. So I'll start with you, Paul. Um, sometimes this feels a bit like our class calls, but <laughs> I'll go ahead anyway. So as, um, as we're seeing every industry is going digital now, um, digital identities uh, increasingly powers our work and our economies. Um, when it comes to digital identity though, um, and digital privacy, user control, security are very critical. Um, can we talk about the concept of good digital identity, why it is, what it is and why it's so important? Uh, thanks, Nalwazi, and um, uh, hello to everyone, and thank you for having me here today. Um, you talk about uh, good digital identity and uh, the digital economy in general. Nalwazi, you know that I always talk about digital identity as the bedrock of a digital economy. You have to absolutely get it right before you can actually embark on an inclusive digital economy. Um, if you don't get digital identity right, then you're always going to find there are 
proportions of the population who are underserved or entirely excluded. So it's vital we get it right. But you can't just have any digital identity. It has to be inclusive. It has to address everyone within a country. Notice that I didn't actually say citizens of a country because there we come into a separate question of um, proving who I am through a digital identity versus what services I'm allowed to access, which is a whole different layer that we can address separately. Um, it has to be such that the, the person who has that digital identity can access it at all times, that it is unique to them and that they are in control of it. So they don't necessarily have to um, share all aspects, all attributes of their identity with everyone they deal with. There should be some capability to limit it. Um, and there, there are degrees of um, degrees of control you can put on it depending on the capacity of, of the individual um, individual person. And you, you can be as simple as I am Paul Makin, or it can be I am over 18, or it could be uh, I, I, have a, I have a driving license. You don't need to know who I am, just as I have a driving license. Um, it can be a whole range of um, uh, options around that. Um, the has, and underlying what I've just said is concepts of um, digital uh, control, cryptography, privacy, and the security. It should not be that my digital identity can be available to everyone. Um, placing it in plain sight is not a great idea. That doesn't mean I'm saying that blockchain isn't a great idea. It's just a question of what you put on the blockchain. And also, I talk about inclusive. Inclusive means it doesn't necessarily uh, only exist on a smartphone. It must be something that I can use in all those areas in so many countries where there is not good data coverage. So offline usage must be possible. And it must be accepted and uh, available to every what's known as relying party, be it government or private sector, in fact. In other words, it has to be ubiquitous if it's going to be a good digital identity and it has to be controlled by the individual. Um, if we don't get these things right, then we don't end up with an inclusive digital economy. And by that, I include digital government. Excellent. Um, I would pose a similar question to Robert then in that case. Your work, Robert, focuses on digital identity, data privacy, user control and security. Paul has given us some of the basic elements that make up the concept of good ID. Would you agree that you have similar thoughts or would you add on to anything um, that he has said? Um, what to you constitutes key elements of good ID and why is that important? Thank you, Samke, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just add on to, to some of the great points that Paul made and, and say that um, as a media, we have supported two elements or two concepts of what digital ID, sorry, good ID looks like. One is supporting the World Bank's ID4D and, and their work on the good ID principles. That's one, one piece of work. And the second piece of work is supporting what we call the good ID movement, right? Yeah. So, um, a community of good ID practitioners, whether they may be funders, they may be civil society organizations, um, researchers around good identity. And so we've also supported the good ID movement, which is primarily um, a community of good ID practitioners on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and other platforms. Um, but just to add on to, to what Paul said in terms of um, the work that the World Bank has been doing on the good ID principles, you know, we, we've we've been working very closely with the World Bank on, on their development of the Good ID Principles together with other partners. And very much as Paul said, you know, three key pillars, one, in, one being inclusion, making sure that um, people within a country, and, and Paul, I like the fact that you skipped the word citizens because it can be anyone within the borders of a country, um, um, are included in, 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 dig, in uh, Good ID. The second would include design, you know, ensuring that um, the design of, sorry, one second, the design of uh, good ID is, um, is, is not only trusted, unique, and secure, um, but 
is also responsive and uh, and and, um, and 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 is also accurate and can be put across an interoperable platform, right? So, and again, we'll provide, we'll protect privacy and agency through system design, depending on what the operators are looking at. And finally, is the governance of uh, of Good ID, which would include how do we protect personal data, um, how do we maintain cybersecurity, and how do we safeguard rights of individuals uh, within a country mm -hmm. as they um, pick up what we call Good ID. So very much agree with what Paul said. And, 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 and like I said, we, we have proactively supported work around Good ID and are also supporting the Good ID community. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I see we've got some questions coming in that are still relevant to what we're discussing. So before I move on to my next question that I had for Paul, which had some other things brewing in my mind, let me stay on the Good ID discussion. And, and the one question we have from the chat is, is, is the Good ID movement open to civil society? You mentioned special media, social media has, as a means of participation. Is this possible? Is this possible at the time for the in, excluded? Um, if I understand your question correctly, yes, the Good ID movement is open to civil society actors and they have actively participated in not only the Good ID movement, but also in providing input to what the good ID principles should look like. Yeah. I think even the second question posed by um, Mohao is quite similar to the one that um, I posed on, on, on social media and where the people can participate. But his question is slightly phrased in a way that he says, can social network-based identity attestation work as a form of digital identity. So that means if the increased number of people in my circle confirm my name, confirm my credentials, can this be taken as credibility in the instances where I don't have a good foundational ID? Clearly somebody who has experience in, in the digital identity <laughs> world, getting, getting on all the keywords there. Um, yeah. 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 Um, I. I Hmm. Robert might dis mm. might disagree with me here, but I think there is a basis for doing that. We ha we have a concept in the financial sector of tiered KYC, where mm. um, you have say four tiers, where four tier four is this person has a very solid digital identity, and we can prove the um, identity from multiple aspects, and um, we have checked it in various other records as well, and it's all good. Down to tier one, where we have a vague idea of who this person is. And um, I've certainly participated, uh, actually drove the development of a financial service in, in Nigeria, where we were working on tier two and tier one. And tier one was essentially sponsorship. So a form of um, social network um, sponsorship for um, a digital identity. We actually were a little cautious around that because we, um, we actually kept a record of who had sponsored whom. So if we subsequently found anything um, wrong with the sponsored person's digital identity, we would then pursue the person who had sponsored them as well. Mm -hmm. So you can do this. Um, and I think that over the last 10 years, the, uh, the digital identity world has gradually edged towards this, which I think is a very welcome thing but it does have to be done under, under a degree of monitoring so that we can, sit, we can control any abuse of this. It can't be just opened up without controls. Uh, yeah, Robert, about, do you agree? Sorry. Uh, can I just ask, because for me, Sorry. it raises questions that, I mean, in, in an ecosystem like China, this would work well because they've already got some form of social rating system. Mm -hmm. But in, a, in an economy with a, a, um, with a high maybe a rate of corruption uh, or something along those lines. It's like this has the potential to read chaos and it may means for more anti-money laundering um, risks because you can just create a lot of other fake profiles that claim to be your mom and your dad and your uncle to attest that you are Paul Macon yep. when in yep. fact you are not. Yes. Um it's all a question of um, a, a risk-based approach to this. You have to understand the risks that you're that you're posing. If it's low risk, if it's uh, if it is being used to give access to services at very low value, 
or of um, financial services with um, low, tr low transactions, then you can manage that risk. You also have to bear in mind, and I know this is slightly controversial, um, the, the prospect of if you exclude people, then they simply revert to um, the under-the-counter economy anyway. I mean, mm -hmm. um, when, when, I've worked, when I've worked on financial services in Nigeria, you find a, in the old paper-based economy where, we, where people didn't have any form of digital identity, we came across communities where there would be one person who had some form of government document and it would be shared amongst the whole village and they'd all access government services through that one particular document. Now, were they committing a crime? No. Well, they were technically, I, I should make it clear. <laughs> but, but the fact is that these people were actually entitled to the service. It's just that nobody had actually ever got around to issuing them with any form of identity documents. Yeah. So the letter of the law, yes, but spirit of the law, no. So you have to think, if we can formalize that to some degree through the use of digital identity and sponsorship, and we can look at the transactions that the identity is being used to underpin, which we certainly can through um, online monitoring platforms, then how big is the risk? There will be some fraud, absolutely. But I think that by trying to aim for absolutes, we, um, we risk essentially denying people legitimate access to service. It's a balance True. to be struck. Yeah. So I love that you're, you're putting in a sprinkling of scripture in there as well with the, <laughs> with the spread of the letter. Um, Robert, I'll pose this question next to you. So we've already covered the fact that we, we understand that people without official ID documents are going to be unable to access formal financial products and services. Could you share your thoughts on how digital ID can solve this access problem. So we understand that there's a proportional um, approach that can be implemented, but how specifically can this ID solve this problem? But you, you could touch on that just slightly, but I want you to really now look at what is the role of financial authorities in supporting digital ID initiatives. And we often speak of financial authorities um, uh, and, and the role they can play. But I'm interested to also hear your thoughts on, on what our governments, um, what role they can play, because we often exclude them from these conversations because we take for, for granted that in Africa, for example, we have some broken governmental structures. So we don't want to include them too much in our solutions thinking. But what are your thoughts? What would you say um, the roles could be? Samke, I'll give you, I'll give you a bit of a controversial opinion. Right, in terms of, of uh, financial services particularly. Um, and, and, and I know Paul is very familiar with this, but if you look at the early days of M-Pesa, you know, the reason why a mobile money platform such as M-Pesa really took off in a country such as Kenya is the fact that unbanked people, right? People who had some form of foundational ID, um, but were not either welcome or um, were not um, seen as potential customers by the formal banking industry, right? And so there was, there was a need to send money P2P, person to person. Um, eventually that need evolved in um, sending money from C to B, customer to business, and then B to B, right? So that has been the platform upon which um, many mobile services have been built upon. Um, and some basic forms of foundational ID were required. I mean, if you show up at, a, at an MPS agent today, you probably need at the very least a national identity card, which is not a digital identity, but it's a national identity card or a passport, depending on you know, where you're from, right? So just going back again to, to your question, um, if you look at say countries such as Somalia, right? The, there's a huge Somali diaspora that lives outside of Somalia in, in various countries around the world. And the amount of money that flows in through informal channels, and I know Paul, you touched on that, right? Um, through informal channels from the Somali diaspora into Somalia is probably 10, 15, maybe even a hundred times the total number of exports that would leave Somalia to another nation, right? Um, and that is hugely done on trust. One or maybe two people may have some form of ID and so money will come in and then that can be distributed to 100, 200 individuals, family members, purely based on trust, right? So what I think is that um, 
you know, financial intermediaries or regulators, um, they are probably playing a catch up game across the African continent because innovation is moving at a much faster rate than regulators can keep up, right? So there's a lot happening on the innovation side of it. And then regulators also need to, to speed up um, their ability to be able to, to regulate in innovation effectively without stifling it, right? So um, I think whether it's banking regulations, um, whether it's, um, you know, um, data protection authorities who are also coming up with, 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 uh, with laws and regulations on how we manage personal data in our countries across the continent, that needs to move at a speed that's very close to, if not equal to what innovation is happening, what the type of innovation that's happening. If um, financial authorities are really going to support uh, the evolution around digital ID across the continent, right? Yeah. Roberts, can I, it's interesting that you mentioned Somalia. Um, I, I have um, some experience there. I, I ran a, a large project there for uh, looking at the um, legitimization of um, remittances into Somalia, because as you, as I'm sure you remember, there was a, a long history of de-risking of banks leaving Somalia because uh, of the, the lack of identity verification of the people that, that, that money was being sent to. And I worked with a number of the banks looking at what we can do about de-risking and bring the formal banking sector back into, into the Somalia market. But what amused me at the time was that um, we were running a whole series of, uh, of um, secret shopper um, exercises on remittances into Somalia from both the UK and from, and from um, Nairobi, in fact. And where, what amused me was that the day after the last bank pulled out of Somalia, the cost of remittances into Somalia actually went down <laughs> because the informal market was working so well that it really didn't need the formal market. And we even found that um, the, the EKYC, the KYC checking at, the, at the, the, uh, the London end sending into Somalia was entirely based on trust, entirely based on who you knew. The diaspora knew who each, each other was, and they never bothered with any identity documents at all. It's just, here's my usual remittance back to my, my uncle um, uh, back in Somalia or wherever it might be. And uh, it was just taken on trust. And it worked reliably. They really didn't need the banks which is a terrible situation for the, the regulatory authorities trying to, trying to sort this out because there was no way of, um, there was no way of really uh, exercising any influence over this. Well, I think what you're, what you're both mentioning here is bringing up a question that I hadn't put in my prepared questions um, is a question of now, if countries are, are developing a digital identity um, system, there's a question of governance and trust here. So how can they overcome this in their stakeholder collaboration to ensure that the consumers will trust the solution and that they will take up the digital identity of their, of their jurisdiction and not see what we saw in Kenya where civil society was not included. And because uh, I'm seeing quite a few questions in the, in the chat where participants are asking about digital ID, content controlling, governance and process procedures. There's a one participant who was asking about how will you prioritize privacy, control and convenience. So I think all of these questions coalesce together. If you're questioning then that how will the governance processes be set in place if a country is now put, looking to put it in? And let's take the case study of Somalia. How could they overcome if they put in a digital identity Put it, bring the people back to trust the government and get them to uptake the identity because they the informal systems working very well for them. Why bother change it if why change it if I fix it if it ain't broke? And was even let me jump in now. You used two words, trust and government, which is a really difficult concept for many people, right, to understand. Um, but I but I think governments do need to do a lot of work in terms of um, building trust among not only their citizens, but also residents in a country by um, one, effective public participation, right? So making sure that everyone who needs to have a say or groups or representatives of people who need to have a say feel 
like their voice um, matters and their voice has been listened to. Um, I know you touched on Kenya and I, and I just wanted to, to say that, you know, when I, when I remember seeing um, Huduma number being rolled out, you know, sometimes governments may feel like if we take out a two page advertisement in a daily newspaper, right, in, in English, that says this is what the Huduma number will do, and this is what these are the benefits to you. By doing that, you've eliminated 50, maybe 60, or even 70% of the population. People, and I mean, literacy issues, language issues, yeah. right? So we should be a bit more proactive in terms of thinking about what are the best channels of communicating, um, um, or what public participation, the channels of public participation should consider taking if we want to get effective public participation or people's views on, on, on a digital ID system. That's, that's my sense. And, and perhaps there's still quite a bit of work to be done in terms of bringing the government authorities and the data protection authorities in each of these countries up to speed on what they need to do um, as they think about rolling out digital ID systems and to gain trust of citizens and residents of their countries. We'll yes, I think- um, The last uh, minutes as we have to close up soon. Yes. Sorry. I was just going to say that it, the Kenyans uh, experience with Huduma numbers it really feels like a missed opportunity. And it, I think it's because of the lack of participation of civil society and the wider, the wider community within uh, within Kenya, because um, I remember meeting some of the, the principals behind Huduma Number, and it it was clear right from the start that it was all about the traditional view of the, of identity as a national security issue, not as that foundational issue as the bedrock of a digital economy, and um, that that saddens me, and you end up with a, a situation where alternative forms of identity start to dominate and that's not great for for any of us i think to wrap up just to give a nod to our participants thank you so much for being so engaging i will just pose one question by precious um when should digital id be avoided and we've given all the examples of what good id is but when should it be avoided and is there a, a um uh, a moment when it should. And then as whoever's going to pick that question up, please also give your final thoughts as we wrap the session up. Okay, well, the, the time you, the, the digital identity you should avoid is the one that you don't have control over. And I'd <laughs> certainly include Facebook in that, I'm afraid. You have yeah. no control of your identity there. Yeah. Robert? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add on to that, that, you know, I, I was looking through the AU's digital transformation strategy, 2020 to 2030, and I get the sense that the fact that we've just, you know, we're still going through the COVID pandemic, um, that transformation strategy or the continental digital transformation strategy has probably been brought forward five, maybe 10 years ahead if um, African governments, or African countries are going to be able to effectively implement the digital ID systems um, to transform Africa's economy into digital economies. Yes. Mm. Well, thank you, Robert, and thank you, Paul. Um, and to my co-moderator, Nolwazi, thank you for being with me on this session. I just want to encourage all of those that are participating to connect with our speakers uh, where possible on, the, on this platform as this conversation is not done. And do join in our alumni events as well so that we'll continue the conversation around good identity. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.